All right. Well, we're on chapter 17 of uh, The Imitation of Christ. And somebody is asking how far along we are. We are just shy of halfway through this book. And uh, the chapters are getting shorter, I've noticed, and they're kind of like one-point chapters. So like last week was that we should find all of our solace, all of our comfort uh, in God alone. And, uh, you know, it's funny because when I first read that, if you, if you had read me that 20 years ago, um, I would have had this image of doing things in God. You know what I mean? It's like just doing religious things, doing spiritual things, that that's where you would find your solace. And I think after 25 years, I'm in a very, very different space than that. And I think that uh, it's a part of a realization is that this divine beloved within is a real thing, which doesn't occur to you yeah. at the beginning. Uh, you know, that it's, it's a very strong presence that grows ever stronger and uh, that most definitely becomes something uh, unimagined. Uh, it becomes a place. It becomes a an experience of being. And so when he's saying here to take solace only in me, it's really talking about developing that idea and that awareness, not, not really developing an idea, but developing your awareness uh, toward your inner world and finding out that love dwells natively there and has a very firm and very stable um uh, security, a place that you can literally take refuge, take, take rest within yourself. And so when you are watching the mind from that shrine in the heart, when the mind is having troubles or, you know, getting, getting pulled out of itself, um, that from this place, you can let go of that and mm -hmm. let the mind do what it's going to do. You don't have to go with it. Uh, and so that was last week's chapter about learning to take solace in God alone, in the divine alone, and that divinity is within you. And this chapter, chapter 17 of book three, uh, so book three is called Interior Conversations, and this one tonight is called uh, Place Cares in God, and uh, the chapter is about all cares must be placed in God. So it's, it's, it's a matter of dealing with anxiety. A matter of dealing with, um, oh yes, goodness, I, I, I was just kind of overwhelmed there for a moment because I was going back in my mind and remembering what it was like when I was living outside the monastery and was always just concerned about things that were ahead of me, you know, like my work schedule, my meetings, my project deadlines, my, uh, you know, my relationship with my boss. All of these things were uh, relationships with friends, you know, the health of my body, all of these things that were always so heavy on my mind. And uh, the frenetic life that I had to live in order to, to maintain an enough distraction to keep myself, in, quote, enjoying life, you know. And so these 25 years in a monastery have given me a very different perspective on how to live. And uh, one of them is definitely for everyone, I don't think just for monastics at all, for everyone to develop this oasis. First of all, recognize that it's there and then go in, go inside in your meditations and become aware of that inner world, you know, uh, just begin poking around in there, find out what's in there. Not, not the mind necessarily. You poke around by, by listening and just placing your awareness in different places in the heart Think of someone you love very much and place your awareness in the heart and feel that love arise and then follow that love, you know, simply by watching it very closely. Where is it coming from? Where is it emanating from? And uh, when you do that and become well aware of that, you know that that love is always there. It doesn't need an object. When you're in the mind, you need an object in order to reflect it to you, to feel it. But when you're in the heart, you don't need an object. You come to realize through lack of distraction 
that this hum, this this perfectly equanimous hum of love, is always within and always available to you. And uh, it's been one of the uh, one of the things that I discovered uh, coming out of my depression, learning how to deal with depression was uh, learning to separate myself from a depressed mind and not identifying myself with the depression that belonged to the mind because the mind is not me. And once I had that space and that separation, then just being, I aming, as it were, <laughs> you, can, you can see that the, 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 the native state of being is love, is having that hum of love within you all the time. And that's how we learn to love equanimously, because that begins to be what spills out of us all the time, because we're not anxious, we're not angry, we're not, you know, uh, stressed out. And so we're able to let go of those things and, and, and dwell in this oasis and then act from that oasis in our life. So that all cares must be placed in God. So Christ is talking to the disciple here again. He says, my child, permit me to do with you what I will. <laughs> such an odd, such an odd, <laughs> such an odd way to start a conversation. Okay. So Christ comes to the disciple, my child, permit me to do with you uh, what I will. For I know what is best for you. You think as a human being and you judge things according to human reason. But you are often swayed by your feelings and worldly attitudes so that you can easily be deceived and make mistakes. Okay, so what's, what's Jesus really saying there in Vedantic terms? He says you're identified with your body and your mind, and so you're not coming from what you truly are, and so your perspective is going to be slanted all the time. So this is why we place a dependence on the presence, the dependence on Christ, on God, uh, to do things for us, to take care of us. That's why we take shelter, take refuge. That's why, uh, you know, when, whenever things are lining up in your mind, when you start realizing, hmm, this is not going to be a good day mentally, I can see my mind is lining up desires and is, is feeling like it wants particular things, uh, that for us, we have a, a, a means of just not having to worry about that because you are not your mind. And you just simply look at the condition of your mind with your chosen ideal. And you just say, look at that. It's, it's lining up to be a tough day there, Lord. I'm just putting my awareness on that because you said that awareness will untie the knots of Maya. Please untie those knots and take care of it because I can't. <laughs> I always get fooled by the mind. I always get talked into the wrong things. And so, and then all you have to do is maintain awareness. Once you've put that prayer up, you just maintain your awareness. And uh, you can't, uh, by, by maintaining that awareness, you can't get fooled. You can't push the things out of your mind uh, that you need to push out of your mind in order to indulge in your wrong thinking. So my child, permit me to do for you, to do with you what I will, for I know what is best for you. You know, you think like a human being. You think that you're a human being. You think that you're a body and a mind, right? So thinking as a human being is being body identified and judging things according to human reason is being mind identified, right? So he's covering both things. You've got a body and mind uh, uh, attachment going on there. And uh, that's going to sway you, you know, the feelings that are going through your mind and your attitudes are going to make you easy to deceive because they're going to tell you that you need things and that you are things and that you should have things. The disciple says back to, to Jesus, Lord, everything you say is true. Your providence is far better for me than any care I can take of myself. Those who do not put all of their trust in you run a great risk of falling. Therefore, Lord, Lord if only my will remain firmly fixed in you, do with me as you please, for whatever you do with me can only be good. Right? So he's he's saying something very important there. He's not just saying, you do with what do with me whatever you want. Fine, you're absolutely right. You know best, you do it. He says, Yes, you do everything for me, but there's one thing I want to, that, that I need to ask of you that you will uh, take my will 
and allow it to be firmly fixed in you. Right. So allow me to be, to have that, that, that fixed will that is resting in you, that constant awareness of your presence, uh, which I will activate that desire to do what is according to my nature. Right. So he's just, that's his one thing. So keep me in an awareness of you and do with me as you like, then I'll be fine. Just don't let me forget you. Don't let me pull my will out of you. Right. And if that remains true, then only good can come because everything will be motivated by pure love. Everything will be motivated by wisdom. This is, this is, this is actually how we uh, develop that equanimity in a world of constant change. There are some things that we know absolutely that God's love is uh, infinite and without condition. That grace is enough that our enlightenment is already completed, that our nature is divine, and that our pure mind and the, and the will of God are in perfect harmony in the true state. If we know those things and sit in that truth, then awareness enough will bring us forward, right? Just constantly re-emphasizing what we know to be true and to not let ourselves forget that in any moment during the day. We talked last week about how important it is for all of us to come up with our own means, with our teacher if we want to, or just on your own if you want to, of not letting yourself forget the divine presence all day long. So whether that's doing what my friend Jackie Bender did when she quit smoking and every time she wanted a cigarette, she had a rubber band on her wrist. Whenever she wanted that cigarette, she would pull that rubber band out and give herself a mighty snap on the wrist as a punishment for thinking about the cigarette. And then she'd pop a piece of gum in her mouth <laughs> and chew it until the flavor is gone and then throw it out. And then the next time, same routine. Anyway, that's how she quit smoking. So she devised her own means of quitting smoking. And we must devise our own means of quitting forgetfulness <laughs> to stop letting our minds wander away from our nature and away from the divine presence within us. If it is your will that I be in the light, may you be blessed, Lord. But if it is your will that I be in the dark, may you also be blessed. If in your mercy you comfort me, be you blessed. But if it is your will that I be afflicted, still you always be blessed. All right. So that's our attitude toward the divine. It's a surrender. There's a big surrender going on there. And even more so, one of the things that I'm enjoying the most kind of practicing is this idea of non-resistance, not pushing against the moment, not letting the moment trigger desire in you or a want for something other, but just letting the moment be what it is, you know, and just stopping occasionally during the day and finding your happiness, finding your bliss. Just stop for a moment, stop all the distractions, stop what you're needing to do. Just stop and just have a little thought of your beloved. Feel the love in the heart and just remember all is well and then get going again. No, just don't forget. So we surrender to, ta to, to Takor, to uh, our divine, and have him carry on with us with trust in that grace and in the movement of life, I'm not the doer. This is all the divine will. I accept it as it comes. If it's good, bless the Lord. If it's bad, bless the Lord. It's all done in love, and it is all for my betterment, and it will lead me home. Christ now says, my child, this is how you must stand if you want to walk beside me. You must be as ready to suffer as to rejoice as willing to be needy and poor as to be rich and have abundance, right? So that's that non-resistance. You have to accept what comes. Don't have a preconceived idea of, of what it is to walk with me. Accept what, what comes. This is one of the things that a lot of, uh, I saw a lot of guys struggle with this when they joined the monastery. I saw, I saw about 10 guys come and go in my 25 years. And the one thing that I saw pretty quickly 
was that if a guy is, if a, if you, if a person, I don't think it has to be a guy, if anybody is joining the monastery to be something, right? Whether you're joining to be a monk or you're joining to, you know, realize God or you're joining, if you have anything tied to why you're joining the monastery, un unless you untie that and destroy it, you're probably not going to stay a monk. Right. Uh, we had one guy that came and uh, uh, when he found out he wasn't going to be able to sit and philosophize at the cafe all day, uh, he was out of there. It took him less than two weeks to figure out that, <laughs> that the monastery wasn't for him. He thought it would be sitting around over coffee with his buddies talking about spiritual life and philosophy uh, at Cafe Trieste there in San Francisco. And when he found out that wasn't the case, you know, he left it. When, when uh, I tell people, when you become a monastic, you're not, you're not doing it for any reason. There's no acquisition or attainment expected from it. You are doing it because you're walking away from what's behind you. <laughs> you're accepting whatever comes in front of you, right? That's, that's, <laughs> that's how it works. And that's a very difficult thing. And, uh, so this is what he's saying here. If you're going to walk with me, understand it means being content with what I give you, which means you're going to have to work on your faith. You're going to have to work on your faith and know that I'm working for your betterment, for your best in all circumstances. Right. Number four, disciple, Lord, I willingly bear for you whatever you are pleased to give me. With indifference, I will take from your hand both good and bad bitter and sweet, joy and sorrow. And for all these things that may happen to me, I thank you with all my heart. <laughs> all right, so we're definitely reading an ideal, <laughs> right? Because not all of us are always going to be able to attain quite that amount of enthusiasm, but it's a good commitment <laughs> to say, whatever you bring my way, I'm going, to be, I'm going to thank you with all of my heart. Awesome commitment. Go for it. Do that. Uh, do the best you can, you know, but don't be surprised if it gets a little bit more difficult than that at times. Keep me from ignorance. Keep me from sin, right? Sin is anything that doesn't take you toward oneness. Sin is anything that isn't in harmony with Satchitananda, you know, with, with this divine, this expressing divine principle that's at our heart. Keep me from sin, Lord, and I will, fin I will fear neither death nor hell. Do not blot my name out of the book of life, and then whatever trouble befalls me will not disturb me. So it's interesting there. He's, you know, above, he was very willing and just very straightforward. Yeah, I'm going to thank, I'll thank you for everything. If it's good, great. If it's bad, bless you. I, no problems at all. But in this paragraph, he's, giving, he's putting up some requirements. He's saying, okay, so I'm making that commitment. Now, on your part, Lord, please, one, keep me from ignorance. Right? Don't let me fall into my bad patterns, to my unhealthy thinking. Don't let me attach and identify with my wrong moods and uh, my wrong identities and goals as a person. So keep me from this ignorance, Lord, and I will fear neither death nor hell. Do not blot my name out of the book of life, right? So keep me in your presence. You know, to, to be out of the knowledge of God is to be out of the book of life. You know, is to be, because it, the, the divine is the light. It is your life. <laughs> it's your way of living. Outside of that, the darkness, there's just distraction, just dullness, you know, to keep away from the suffering that you don't know why it's there, where it's coming from. You're trying all kinds of things. You're always trying to fill yourself up with something and you're not finding anything that works. And you're just getting more and more desperate. So he's saying, don't let that happen to me. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to think of you. Don't let me fall into ignorance. Don't let me become unaware of you. Do not blot my name out of the book of life. And whatever trouble befalls me will not disturb me because being with you and in you is 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 enough that's that is life right and in my vlog yesterday we talked about the way that this really happens is by coming into the moment 
being a being consciously in the moment is to be consciously aware of the presence because the presence of God and the present moment are the same thing. They are not separate. And so to be aware of presence, to be aware of the isness in this moment is to be aware of the presence of the beloved. And in this moment, this moment is all that there ever is. So you don't live your life on a line. If you live your life on a line, you're going to forget God because you'll have your past to pull you into those memories. You'll have the desires of your future to pull you into those hopes and ideals. And the, your attachments and your desires are just going to be pulling you back and forth across the moment, but never allowing you to be in the moment. When you're in your head, listening to your thinking, you're living in the past because a thought doesn't have time to spontaneously be in the present with you. So only silence can exist in the present because in the present, it, there is no change, right? There is no change. Change only happens when, a, when the mind takes a snapshot of the present, then takes another snapshot of the presence and compares the two. And that's how ego is formed. It creates a narrative to explain the difference in the two snapshots. And that narrative is your personal Maya, right? All right, chapter 18. That all temporal sorrows are to be borne patiently after the example of Christ. So temporal sorrows, that just means everything within time. Uh, the fact that everything, that nothing lasts here. Uh, it was, you know, this week was, I had a really difficult morning the other morning because, you know, I've spent my life saying goodbye all the time. <laughs> I was just, you know, I moved 14 times before I was 18. And so goodbye has just become a theme of my life, constantly moving, constantly leaving one group of people and going to another. And it's one of the, the hardest, the saddest things in my, in my heart is to say goodbye. It's just like, ah, oh, God, nothing hurts like a goodbye, especially if it's a permanent goodbye, like to someone who's passing away. Right. And so that's, that is this temporal world. The whole, all of life, of course, yes, it's about saying hello also, <laughs> but because it's temporal, it's always about saying goodbye because in the end you say all of your goodbyes with no hellos, right? And so life is really about learning to say goodbye. And so this is what this chapter is going to teach us how to do this, how to live with our temporal sorrows and how they are to be borne patiently. So Christ says, my child, I come down, I came down from heaven to save you. I look upon myself, your myth, I look upon myself, your, I took, sorry, took. my eyes are getting bad. <laughs> I took upon myself your misery, not because I had to do so, but out of love. I wanted you to learn patience and to bear the trials of this life without complaint, as I have done for you. From the hour of my birth until my death upon the cross, I was never without sorrow or suffering. I endured the want of temporal things. Many and frequent were the complaints I heard against me. I humbly bore the shame and the insults. I received ingratitude for my benefits, blasphemies for my miracles, and rebukes for my true doctrine. Right? So he's just saying, look, look, I know what you're talking about. And this, this is the point of God's incarnating for us. Uh, it, there's no way for us to develop the kind of faith in love. Uh, there's no way for us to develop an acceptance of such an unusual grace without this relationship with the divine. And if the divine didn't materialize, come here and, and visit so that we could see what, is, what does it mean to have an unconditioned love? What does it mean to have an infinite grace? What does it mean? Uh, you know, to to forgive without requirement. You know, well, this is why uh, Jesus is born or Ramakrishna or Buddha is born. So that they can live this life where they suffer the same sorrows, they suffer the same desires, they suffer the same wants and needs that we do. And yet, do it without getting caught. 
they are able to live in the midst of all that and still be infinitely inspiring. You know, I'm just amazed at how you can read read the gospel and just <laughs> how many tears you can shed of inspiration in just a couple of pages. You know, Takur doing the most beautiful things and saying the most delightful things and just being so kind to everyone, always, always saying the exact most helpful thing in every in every way. So this is why why Jesus is 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 putting himself out there for us, saying, "Look, I've come and I've I've borne all of this. Do it like I did." And how do we do it? We keep our mind on the beloved. Keep our mind on the spirit, on the self. Don't identify with body and don't identify with mind. And then all of the walk of this life becomes quite, quite beautiful, refreshing, actually, because every moment is new. Uh, there is no calcification of thought in the moment. There's always freedom. You can always go left or right. It's your choice. <laughs> The disciple, well, Lord, since you were patient during your lifetime, thereby fulfilling the will of your father, it is only right that I, a most wretched sinner, should bear all things patiently according to your will, and for as long as it pleases you, should support the burden of this corruptible life for the sake of my soul's salvation. All right, so he's saying, yeah, it's only right. <laughs> Which is, okay. It's God. Of course, it's all right. <laughs> it's the divine beloved. So, yes, uh, you know, and it's Jesus did it without being a wretched sinner. <laughs> so I don't know why he feels the need to bring in wretched sinner as being our motive for doing it. If Jesus was able to do it without having to have the motive of being a wretched sinner, then obviously that's the better way to do it. <laughs> so we do it through inspiration. If you do it through being a wretched sinner, uh, that's egoism. That's going to be egoism because you're going to have to do it by trying to make up for being a wretched sinner. You can't make up for being a wretched sinner. That's the whole point uh, of grace. That's the whole point of love, of, of the divine love. And Holy Mother saying, it's not your job to clean your dirty diaper. You're my child. It's my job to clean up your dirty diaper you just sit still in front of me long enough for me to do it without getting poop everywhere. <laughs> Maybe they're working under the idea that the more wretched the sinner, the more implicit of a great saint that they will be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it's true. I mean, if as long as we're in the ego self, we should, we should be always be aware that as an ego self, there is no value in us. Right. An, an ego self is always going to make the wrong move. And uh, but mother has placed that in us. It's her game. So we can't identify Ooh. with that weakness and say that, oh, I'm such and such. Because before she threw you into Maya, she placed within you her own image, the image of God. That is the whole of it right there. Once that image of God is within you, how can anyone say I'm a sinner? Even if the body-mind is behaving in the worst kinds of ways, you are the image of God that's been placed within you. You are not all of the other stuff. And so we come to know this, and we begin to clear out our identity. And when we come to know, I am the image of God, I am Satchitananda, that is how I act, because that is what emanates inspiration from within me. And that inspiration happens without me having to be anything other than the self, my true self. This life is tedious and a burden to the soul, but now through your grace, it has become very meritorious. And by your own example and that of your holy saints, it has been made easier and more hopeful for the weak. Indeed, that's the whole point of the path, right? Of having these established paths for us to bring us forward. <gasps> The presence is also much richer in consolation than it was under the old law. When the great, when the gate of heaven was shut and the way to it obscure, and so few desired to seek it, right? And what he's what he's alluding to here is in Christianity, they have two covenants with God. In the Old Testament, the first covenant was the Ten Commandments, 
and you had to live perfectly. And if you made a mistake, you had to sacrifice an animal or give a gift or pay up. In some way, you had to make up the difference. And it was done through sacrifice. It was done through, you know, offering animals at the right times of the years uh, and in the right quantities and blah, 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 like that. And then the new covenant was the, the coming of the Messiah, the coming the, that was predicted in the Old Testament. And the Christians believe that to have been Jesus. And the new covenant said, I, God, am going to come and sacrifice my own self so that nothing will separate us anymore. And you don't have to sacrifice any more animals and you don't have to make your own atonements anymore. You just place your love and your faith in me, and I've got you covered, right? And Ramakrishna says the same, Buddha says the same, Rama said the same, Holy Mother says the same. Uh, they just don't make a doctrinal point of it. They simply say, come, <laughs> be in my presence, feel my love, understand how deep it is, how sincere it is, how earnest it is. Know that I will do anything to bring you home and that you need not worry because I will bring you home that's the crux of it that is the path of, of of devotion i like what he says here though the present is also much richer in consolation than it was under the old law when the gate of heaven was shut right and obscure so he's talking about the present it's like being you know this present is much is much greater when i know that that it is established on the grace of God, that my relationship with the divine is established on grace and, and an unconditioned love. It's not, it's not uh, uh, standing on my performance or the quality of my attainments or achievements in spiritual life. It's not that. And anytime we want to weigh ourselves by those things or find our confidence <sighs> in those things, we run the danger of what Bhrikkhu did to Ramakrishna. When she became encouraged by the idea that I've built a bathing god for other people and she decided to come forward and, and be bold and touch Takor's feet on the basis that she had earned it because she had done something good for all these people by building the bathing god, what happened? Takor jumped up. He was stung like a scorpion because she was an impure woman. He was making that point. You do not approach me for a relationship based on your own merit, based on what you are. No, you cannot do it. We, it cannot happen because the you that you're trying to bring before me is a you that only exists in ignorance. And it can't be the one that comes to relationship with me. My relationship with you is because I love you. And you are here because I have invited you. And you are in my shrine doing practice because I have invited you and I want you here and I want you successful, you know, and we hear that and we feel that and we sit and we do our practice out of a graciousness, out of a gratitude of the invitation. It's like, oh, my God, really? <laughs> You know, it's like that day that that retreat last year, last fall, when we went up there to the mountains, when I, I told that story where I wandered into that little grove of aspens and sat there, I was just overwhelmed by the beauty. And I just turned to God in a moment. I was like, oh, for me, you did this for me, this little grove for me to meditate in today. You, you've done this. And of course, I, I tell you, my mind rebelled like you selfish, you know, egotistical fool. no. God wouldn't do this for you. He just did this and you're just enjoying it. And then the other side, I heard mother come in and said, no, my child, I did do this for you. Come sit. Let's enjoy it together. And I had a beautiful meditation just sitting in the middle of the aspen trees, knowing that my mother had put them there for me for this experience today. And it changed the way that I, that I walked through the world because I look for these things that mother has done for me these little vignettes of beauty that she has placed everywhere along the sidewalk or the city or the park or a tree or out my window. But I, trained, I try never to, to miss them. I try to notice them 
And I always make a point of kind of looking up out of the corner of my eye toward mother and saying, I saw it. Thanks. That was cool. Right. And so we live like that because that's really what's happening. This world is divine and it is a gift for you. And all the beauty that's there, you can see because mother is in you. And she has given you that ability to see beauty. And she has given you that ability to love and to feel love. And she has given you the present moment as a constant reminder that she is within you, around you, over you, under you, beside you. That is the present moment, is her presence, right? So we know this. And so he's talking about this old, this old testament, this old uh, covenant with God where you had to sacrifice. He says, even the just of those days who were ordained to be saved could not enter the kingdom of heaven before you paid their debt by your sacred passion and death. Number three, oh, what gratitude am I not? What gratitude am I not bound to return to you for your great mercy in showing me and all the faithful who follow you the true and straight way to your kingdom? Your holy life is our way, and by holy patience we make our way to you, who are our head. Had you not gone before and shown us the way, who would have even tried to follow you? How many would have lagged behind had they not your blessed example before their eyes? We are still slow and lukewarm. Though we have heard of all your miracles and your doctrine, what would we be if we had not your life to guide us? Certainly our minds and our desires would have been attached to worldly things. Right. So it's again through this relationship with our ideal, our highest beloved, that we're able to detach our mind and desires from worldly things, from things that change, things that go away, always, things that do not last. All right. Chapter 19. On the patient suffering of injuries, and who is really patient? Christ, what are you saying, my child? Stop complaining and consider my passion and the sufferings of my saints. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. What you suffer is but little compared with those who have borne so much for me, who have been strongly tempted, grievously affected, and put to the test in so many ways. You ought to remind yourself of the intense suffering that others have endured for me, that you may bear your own little miseries more easily. All right, so that's, that is a way of doing it for sure. You have to be careful <laughs> by doing that. It's, it's okay to compare yourself to others when you're trying to humble yourself, where you're trying to lower your opinion of yourself. But it is incredibly dangerous to, um, to compare yourself to others to feel better about yourself. Uh, if you do that, you're not going to get very far for a very long time. <laughs> so in general, it's not a good idea to compare yourselves to others. But when you're sitting there feeling really good about yourself, it's good to look around and find an example of someone who's doing better to help you be a little bit more humble about it. Because we approach God with the need for an infinite grace. And in order to get that infinite grace, we have to present an infinite humility. So we have to know that we have everything by the invitation and love of God alone. It's not, it's not by anything else. And that we have our place with the divine because, because God gives it. Right. And so this is how we hold our place, hold ourselves in a place of gratitude, right? A place of constantly inspired love. If they do not seem so little to you, take care that you do not magnify them because of your impatience. However, whether they think little, they are little or great, always try to bear them patiently, willingly, and without complaint, right? So this, he's just talking about how do we how do we practice non-resistance? Accept everything by bearing them patiently, 
willingly and without complaint. And also trying to turn, turn everything that we get, the good and the bad, into gold as an offering to give back to the moment, back to the divine. The better disposed you are to suffer them, the more, the more wisely you act and the more merit you will have because you have prepared yourself for it and are well disposed to accept it. Right, so how do we prepare ourselves for it? Anybody wanna throw out an idea here? How do we prepare to ourselves to accept the moment as it is, the good and the bad? I think, you know, realizing that it's all the same, it all comes from one source, you know, it's the same, to me, it's the same story where Durga comes out of the river and eats the infant, you know, and, <laughs> you know, it's just one is implicit of the other. And, you know, it's, you just accept it as the whole, you know, once you've seen the greater perfection, you know that, you know, in the, in the, when you zoom in, it looks like chaos and suffering, but when you zoom out, it's perfection. Hmm. Very good. So, so you're saying just keep, keep yourself aware. It all comes from the same source that love is the motive behind all of it. Would that be akin well, to what you're Yeah. You know, but part of being able to do that is practicing the awareness uh -huh. of keeping God on the mind and purifying the mind. I think personally, I think without that, your awareness is going to slip so much that you're not going to be able to stay in that high of a level. Yeah. Yeah. That, that preparing, that purification of mind is definitely there. So we have to withdraw from body and withdraw from mind or at least honor the boundary between them and self. Well, until I, I, I kind of think of it as you purify the thoughts of the body out of the mind. Right. Well, well purifying, purifying always means eliminating the thoughts of me and mine. That's what purifying means. And so we, we remove me and mine from the body and we remove me and mine from the mind, you know, until we're sitting in a silence that happens when that, when that, withdrawal happens in truth then the mind is is no longer disturbed and the mind then sits in silence um, to be silent yes, yes. to be silent in, in, is, is a beautiful thing i mean it it's it's not about oral science silence you know it's not just put earplugs in your mind in your ears and there now it's silent that's not at all what, what we're talking about right i mean for us, that spiritual silence is a contentment of body, contentment of mind uh, that happens through just withdrawal of the self from it. You know, it's like letting well, it be. Well, too, you know, one of the prerequisites would be that you would have to realize you're not the body also. Well, you don't have to have the realization yet, but you can withdraw from it. Knowing that you're not the body is a very, fairly straightforward exercise. Uh, it just takes some consistent practicing of observing the fact that it's talking to you all the time that it's constantly reporting to you but you know you see how people that are highly rooted in the body and the concrete world they have a really hard time with that i think yes but we're not those people yeah i know <laughs> i'm just <laughs> saying that but that does seem to be a you know the but but even still we still have some residual of that that we that will creep in when we fall down through the levels you know what i mean yeah no it will always in. be in the high highest <laughs> right but that's why talk says that little bit that little remnant uh make it the make it the servant of mother or make it the child of mother or make it the lover of god you know so that ego that remains the ego that keeps popping back up again talk says don't worry about it that's normal for, for normal people, that's normal. Don't worry about that too much. If that egoism, that sense of separateness from me remains, that's fine. Just just put it in my service, you know. Make sure it's in relationship with me, whether as its lover, as its husband, as its mother, as its child. In some way, put that egoism in service to me. 
is what he says. So this is what he would be saying here. So that's great. Those are all the points I was hoping for. Right? Bear them patiently, willing them. The better disposed you are to suffer them, the more wisely you act and the more merit you will have because you have prepared yourself for it and are well disposed to accept it. Do not ever say, I cannot endure this thing from such a person, nor should this be expected of me. For that person has done me a great wrong, accusing me of things I never thought of. But from someone else, I am willing to put up with what I think is fitting for me to suffer. This is a foolish thought, for you are forgetting the virtue of patience and by whom its practice is rewarded, only considering the persons and the offenses done. Right. Uh, really, what he's saying, I think it'd be easier to say all of that by just saying, recognize God in everyone and know that that you are getting the treating the treatment that is most helpful to you for the condition and circumstance of your ignorance at the moment right <laughs> that don't uh, be patient toward everyone and those people that are just consistently horrible uh salute them from from a distance and what does that mean that means respect them but don't go mess with them <laughs> Right, so we always have respect for each other. We always respect the image of God that is in everybody, regardless of whether we can see it or not, <laughs> regardless of whether they know it or not. We always respect the image of God in each other, always and for foremost. And then we we deal with that image in each other, and we do that because if we deal with personalities, God only knows where the personality is going to come. From. 10 minutes from now, you know, or what direction it's going to come from tomorrow. It's like, so when we deal with personalities and people and we befriend personalities and people and we make our actions toward other people requisite upon their behaviors and their actions toward us, that's just worldly relationship. There's no benefit in that. It will be what it is. It'll just be a dance going up and down, you know, sometimes good times, sometimes bad times. But as spiritual folks, we want to kind of bring that into an equanimity. And so we do that by working on seeing God and dealing with God first and foremost in each other. And so we hear words from each other and we hear that from the beloved. And we give those words to the beloved in ourself, right? So like whenever someone asks to spend time with me, God knows why that would be. We spend time together always. When I'm in, when I'm in a conversation with somebody, when they're expecting to have something wise said or something helpful said, that's impossible for me. <laughs> I can't be responsible at that level. And so the way that I've done this, the way that I've dealt with being a Swami when I, <laughs> when I can't, can't believe that circumstance, I hand everything to mother. I'm like, mother, will you hear what this person is saying? What in the world should they do? <laughs> what, a, what a pickle they've gotten themselves into. I don't know what to tell them. And they're not here for my opinion. They're here for your opinion. They're here for your guidance. Give them something for crying out loud. <laughs> what, what can we do? See, so that's a way for us to keep that constant awareness of the presence there so that we can be giving from mother to everyone. We don't have to wonder, how am I going to answer this question? What should I say now? Should I say this? Should I say that? That's all egotistical thinking. You don't you don't think at all about what you're saying. You you listen to the person. You're present with the person. And out of you just being present with that person, mother will say what she wants to say. She'll get the message across. You don't have to calculate it out. You don't have to design it and write it. You be present. Mother will take care of the rest. Right? You be present. Mother will take care of the rest. Therefore, they are not truly patient who will suffer only as much as they please and from whom they please. Persons who are really patient do not mind who causes their suffering, whether it be their superior, an equal, or someone of lower rank, or whether such a person is good and holy, or evil and unworthy. But whenever any adversity happens to them, Whatever it is, and from whomever it comes, or how often, they accept it gratefully as from the hand of God, right? And so this is just another way of saying that. 
see God in everyone always. See God in everyone always. Look I for really that. like that point, though, because, you know, I really never thought of it that hard about the lack of, of the equanimity on on the way you feel about who the suffering came from. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, well, it happens when we live, when we're pretty firmly established in our ego self, then we know the picking order, and we're consciously aware of that picking order, pecking order all the time, all right? So, so these are folks who are very much stuck in their ego self, that they'll, they'll tolerate some difficulty from someone who's worthy of being tolerated, you know, a friend or a superior or their boss, but if you're underneath them and you dare to speak against them, or if you are an equal and you dare to give some advice, then you suffer the, ang the, the anguish of a, of a poked ego. <laughs> that's, that's always a bite, you know? But whenever any adversity happens to them, whatever it is, and from whoever it comes or how often, they accept it all gratefully right? And I, we keep talking about this gratefulness comes from the knowledge that your value is because of the love of God, not because of you. They accept everything all gratefully as from the hand of God, right? So no matter who's doing it, they understand that it is God moving in everyone. They consider it from the hand of God and then consider it as a great benefit. Why? Because it's been motivated by a pure love for you. So whatever is coming at you is coming at you for your benefit. For they well know that there is nothing we can suffer for God that goes without merit. So be ready to fight to win the victory. Without a conflict, you cannot obtain the crown of patience. If you reject the suffering, you reject the crown also. But if you wish to be crowned, resist strongly and suffer patiently. There is no rest without labor, nor victory without battle. Right? Okay. <laughs> they like those ideals and they like those examples, so we'll let that example be there. But let me warn you that if you wish to be crowned, <laughs> you're going to run into some troubles. <laughs> right? You, you, Because it, it's funny to me that they allow that idea of wishing to be crowned uh, and yet spend all of this time calling you a worm and a, a you know, a, an unholy wretch. It's like, so. And also that it's a war that must be won. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Instead of there is no war. <laughs> well, there, but there is a war, even in Vedanta, we, the, the, the battle of Kurukshetra is going on. So there's, there's no denying a war. There is, in fact, a war happening, a war between light and dark, between our higher self and our lower self, between knowledge and ignorance. So there is a war. It's, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a war. I mean, it is in all of the discussions of it, because what else do we know? But yeah, the war we'd have to let stand, because we do have to fight. We do have to push against our creeping laziness, you know, our constant nagging lusts and desires, our constant ignorance. We do have to beat those things down. We do have to discipline ourselves. You know, we have to get up on time. Otherwise, the time we get up just keeps getting later and later and later. Right? Yeah, but it's kind, of, it's kind of cheating when you know you're in the matrix and you already know the outcome. <laughs> you know? Well, uh, no, it wouldn't be cheating at all. That would be, that would be very successful. That would be very beautiful. <laughs> For you, you would get an advantage in every way. There's no cheating. <laughs> well, you know, it's a figure of speech. It'd be like push the easy button. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. No matter how you, no matter how you do it, there's something to be said about it. <laughs> Even pushing the easy button, because Takor, the sages really think that that's all we have to do. <laughs> it's one of the infuriating things I run into. You know, over the years is talk or telling me that realization is easy <laughs> you know they say it and mother says it you can have it right now if you want it and you're like i want it how come i don't have it she's like so, well, how, so how come you don't believe her swami 
Right. Well, that's exactly it, isn't it? I'm just as bewildered by it as you are. <laughs> Yeah, it's these it's these sub these these bad habits that have gotten so deeply ingrained that we we have to practice just to become aware of them, let alone practicing to overcome them to to you know, but we have to we have to to become aware of all these different levels. We've been putting plates on this dirty plates on this stack for a very, very long time. Uh, or as mother says, you know, you have to pour water into an inkwell until mm -hmm. it runs clear. And so that's what we have to do. We just have to keep saying the name of God and keep getting up every day and practicing. And one day we'll live a perfect day. And then it'll be finished <laughs> as such, perhaps. Mm. All right. Disciple, oh Lord Jesus, make possible to me by grace what is impossible by nature. Ah, that's the whole thing right there. That's the longing. That's the crying out to mother right there. Oh Lord. Make possible to me by grace what is impossible by nature, right? Do for me what grace can do for me, what I'm unable to do for myself. You know well how little I can bear and how easily I am upset by a little adversity. Therefore, I beseech you that hereafter any trouble or adversity may be loved and desired by me for your name, for it is very good and very profitable to my soul to suffer and to be afflicted for you, right? With that awareness of the love behind it, with that awareness of your infinite grace that's pulling me toward you. It's always a beautiful thing. So let's stop there. <laughs>